I don't know about you, but uh, I know this is like basketball country, but I'm from, I'm from South Louisiana, and, and so we, we love football there. Like, we go to high school in eighth grade so that you could play football and get on the uh, high school team, because the only way of getting out of New Orleans is, is athletics. It's definitely not education, and so, um, but in, it being from South Louisiana, I absolutely love LSU, and, and as an LSU fan, I absolutely abhor, and I think this is just true regardless of where you are, uh, I abhor Alabama, and one of the reasons I abhor Alabama is because uh, they're so good. Like, I just, it just aggravates me how good they are, that like, like one of their starters could get hurt, and uh, like the next man up on the roster just like steps up and like ends up being like an All-American. You're like, dude, like, what? like that's not even fair. Like, they did, like, I think I saw something that said that they have a five-star recruit in, on, in every position for next year. I was like, man, that's wonderful. Uh, I say all that to say, I say all that to say that uh, this morning, last, or late last night, uh, Garrett, our, our, our worship leader here, uh, is calling me and he's like, I've slept for like 18 hours today and I am absolutely exhausted. I don't know what's gotten over me and, uh, and praise God uh, that in his goodness, he has given us an even deeper bench than Alabama, that we have many people at Christ Community uh, that, that, that can do uh, what I can't, which is lead worship through song. And so we're blessed in more ways than you even know that you, it wasn't me up here with a guitar singing. So Caleb, thank you for stepping up and using the gift that God has given you. Um, grateful for you, buddy. All right, all that aside, if you have a Bible, Genesis chapter four, and uh, while you're getting there, if you're a first time guest, again, we are so delighted that you're with us this morning. Um, There is, or there was, or if you can't find it, it's underneath you, you sat on it, uh, this card sitting on your chair. And uh, if you would just do me one favor, my only ask of you today, do me one favor, fill out that card uh, and just give us enough information so that we can follow up with you. You will get a phone call from me later this evening. It'll be a 504 number. It is not spam, it is actually me, I promise. And so I have to say that because if I don't say that, I get all voicemails. But if I do say that, then I get great conversations. And so uh, 504 number will be calling you this evening. And uh, just drop this either in the offering box on the way out or next steps at the very back of the room. And, and hey, there's also this teal card that's sitting about every other seat or so. Uh, and, and here's the thing. If, if at any point today, uh, God prompts something in your heart and as you're listening, as you're engaging in worship, there's something that God is doing. Um, just a, a quick little note, you, you just fill this out, you could drop it off at Next Steps and, and we will follow up with you. If, this, if there's not a box on there, uh, like you could add your own box and write whatever you want and that would be just fine too. And uh, one last thing and then we'll really finally fully jump in, but uh, our, our women tonight, are going, our ladies are going to be uh, gathering together at our Huntersville campus for what is called Reclaim. And so if you have not already seen signed up, I don't care, just go anyway. Uh, I'm not in charge of the event, so I don't have to worry about the food order. So, uh, but I would love for, I know we already have a group of ladies, but I would love if you're not signed up to join us tonight as Pastor Ronnie's wife, Marcy, leads that event. My wife will be there, I believe, after the event. Several of our ladies are actually gonna be table hosts there, I believe. Uh, after the event, my wife is organizing something to where uh, maybe ice cream or something afterwards. And so for, for, for the Denver campus specific. So we're just trying to create spaces for us to be able to engage as we are a new congregation here on this side of the lake. All right, Genesis 4, and I'm actually stepping into it, and I mean it this time. Um, As we come to Genesis 4 this morning, we're going to get a glimpse of our reality, of our our human nature, of the reality of of who we are, not how we were made, but who we are as a result of sin. Because last week we were in Genesis 3 and we saw how when sin entered into the world, it had a ruinous effect on everything that God has created within his perfect paradise, within his creation, within his world. And, And this morning as we leave the garden, we're gonna get a glimpse of, of life outside of Eden. And, and to be, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's not a pretty picture, right? It's not a pretty picture. No, as sin spreads throughout society, we don't see humanity, humanity gaining some sort of herd immunity, if you will. We don't see the strains or the variants of sin weakening over time. I thought that might resonate. But in fact, it's, it's actually had the opposite effect. As sin has spread throughout society, it's had the opposite effect. It's not gotten weaker, it's gotten stronger. As sin spreads, its grip only gets stronger from one generation to another. East of Eden, the sin of man has brought about the the sting of death. And whereas 
God in, in Genesis 1 has taken the tohu vavohu that we talked about in Genesis 1, 2, the, the, the meaningless wasteland wilderness that, 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 that existed in the very beginning where God has taken all of that and provided a perfect paradise, a perfect place for us as his people to be able to flourish with him as co-rulers and co-reigners and co-resters with him for all of eternity, whereas God has taken that sin in a moment in Genesis 3, undoes all that God has made, all that God has, has given us. And Genesis 4 is a picture of God's creation, the perfect creation that he's given us, spiraling out of control, if you will. Spiraling out of control as a result of the depravity of man. As a result of the depravity of man. So. All that's to be said, let me show you what I mean. If you have a Bible, Genesis 4, starting in verse 1, if you're okay with it, we're going to do a little bit of, if you're not okay with it, we're still going to do it this way because that's how I've prepared, but um, we're going to, we'll, we'll read a little bit and we'll, we'll pause and we'll comment and we'll talk about it and we'll, we'll work our way through all of Genesis 4 that way. So Genesis 4, starting in verse 1 says, now Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and, and Cain a worker of the ground. I wish you could have seen Pastor Ronnie as we're gathered together this week and we, our, our, our staff team, our pastors come together on every Tuesday about 1.30 uh, and uh, sometimes we're productive and sometimes we're not. Um, this, this week we were fairly productive but we get together and we talk about the text and uh, Pastor Ronnie uh, uh, reads verse one and he says, I have gotten a woman or gotten a man, whatever. And uh, it was just like the most like hick hillbilly Tennessean thing I've ever heard. And I was like, okay, all right. But maybe that's how Eve said it. I don't know. But you, here's what you gotta remember. You've gotta remember that Adam and Eve have just been excommunicated out of the garden. I don't even just been excommunicated out of the garden because of their sin. And so put yourself in their shoes. I would only imagine that, again, I'm stepping away from the text. This is my thought. I, but, if, but if I were them, I think that, that, that as a result of, of, of their choices, the, the sin and the consequences and the effects of their choices, I would imagine that that would be fresh on their hearts still. That they'd be fresh on their minds, that their hearts would be tender to the new reality that they are experiencing as a result of their choice of, of disobedience. And so having conceived and, and giving uh, birth to Cain, and Cain, his name literally means to get or, or to acquire, Eve is obviously very excited as she, as she looks uh, down upon the, the face of her firstborn child and reflects back on the promises of God, right? And and she thinks about God's promise in Genesis 3.15 where he promises to crush the enemy through one of her offspring. And so she shouts out, I have gotten a man. I have acquired a man. I have caned a man, if you will. And you can tell that Eve is, is convinced that, that, that Cain is the answer to God's promise. You know how I know that? Because of what she names her second son. She names him Abel. Abel means vanity. Abel means breath. It means vapor. So think of like Ecclesiastes where, where, where Solomon says, uh, vanity of vanities, all of life is, everything is, is meaningless. That's what Abel is. So she just said, I've gotten a man. And that one's meaningless. That second one is, a, is, a, is, a, is insignificant, if you will. So Cain evidently was very clearly a, Eve's favorite but yet it was Abel who found favor with God. Cain was, was her favorite, but it was Abel who found favor with God. You keep reading in verse three, it says, but in the course of, of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering, an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought an offering, and, and he brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the, their fat portions. And so in other words, Abel has brought his, his, his first. Abel has brought his, his very best, like his sacrifice, his offering was a costly sacrifice. Like it required something of him. It cost him significantly. Hebrews 11 in the New Testament, as they're reflecting back on this moment, the author of Hebrews in, in verse four says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. So why, why, why was it? What was it about Abel's offering that was better than, than Cain's offering? Well, you, you would go back and you read it, look at verse three, and it tells us that Cain just brought an offering. 
Whereas Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions, the, the fat was the very best. You go to Leviticus and you read about how, how the fat of every sacrifice is to be burned to the Lord so that, that the aroma of that fat would be the best, the most prized portion of the sacrifice, that that aroma would go up to the nostrils of God as a pleasing sacrifice. He gives the very best that he has, but yet it is Cain, verse three tells us, he just brings an offering. He's not bringing his first or his best. He's merely bringing something in order to to get something, which is why in Jude 11, again, you go to the New Testament, they reflect back on this moment and they're warning about false teachers who are to come. And and what do they say? They say, be weary, be mindful of, 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 of false teachers who walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain. Be, be, be mindful of, of those false teachers who, who walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain. And so here we are, we think about the depravity of man. As we, as we consider the depravity of man as, and we look at sin setting in, you can see that depravity very first right here, that whereas Abel gave in faith, Cain gave for gain. Whereas Abel gave in faith, Cain gave for gain. And you keep reading and, and Moses tells us, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So, so Cain was very angry and his, his face fell. He, he, he began to pout, like he had a frown on his face is, is, the, is the language within the Hebrew, which means, get this, God is not going to be fooled by our worship. God is not going to to be fooled by our worship. In in the original language, the way that this sentence, this verse is formatted, it's Abel and his offering and it's Cain and his offering. Like like you can't separate the worshiper from his offering. Like the two actually go together and God knows the heart that is behind our motives when we worship. You cannot fool God. And so while it's true, yes, that we cannot earn uh, we cannot earn God's acceptance. That does not mean that we are excused from putting forth any sort of genuine effort towards God. Yes, it is true that the gospel adamantly opposes our seeking to earn God's favor. That is absolutely 100% true. Like, like we can't earn God's favor. Abundantly true within scripture. But that does not mean that we cannot put forth effort. Actually, the, the gospel in no way opposes us putting forth effort. Even just reading this morning in my own quiet time, like walk in a manner worthy of what you've been called. Like I've got to put my feet forward walking in faith. The gospel does not allow me to earn God's favor, but it definitely requires and suggests that I would put forth effort, that I would put forth effort in trying to to grow in godliness. And so in fact, worship without effort is not worship, but manipulation. Worship without effort is not worship, but manipulation. Because worship without effort has me as the end goal, has me trying to get something at the end of it as a result. I'm only doing it because I want to get something from God. Which again goes back to Nick Cain's name being to get, to acquire. Worship without effort is not worship, but actually manipulation. And yet despite all of that, despite that being the reality of which Cain has come to the Lord, what amazes me is is God in his grace actually gives Cain a second chance, which is good news for every single one of us, that God gives him a chance to confess his sin and to try again. That the Lord said to Cain in in verse 6, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? But again, we see the depravity of man in that whereas Eve in Genesis 3 had to be talked into her sin, Cain in Genesis 4 couldn't be talked out of it. Whereas Eve had to be talked into her sin, Cain could not have been talked out of it. Because you keep reading and God tries to warn Cain in the back part of verse six or seven, verse seven here says, and if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is, is cr- contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Sin is like, an, like a beast of an animal that wants to devour you, that wants to seek to destroy you. And you have to put forth effort to, 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 to rule over it, you, or you will be ruled over by it, that you will be destroyed by it. 
God gives Cain this warning saying, come on, man, like, like it's okay. Like, add a boy, like, I still love you. I'm still here. Go again. But Cain couldn't be talked out of his sin. Verse eight says that Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and he killed him. You see, rather than listening to the, to the word of God, Cain allows for anger and jealousy to, to, to fester within his heart. Rather than, than heeding the warning of God, he, he lets sin take root in his heart. And those seeds of sin bore fruit within him and, and he's now done what was, think about it, previously unimaginable. Like, like think about it for a moment. Like where did Cain get the idea to kill his brother? Like prior to this moment, murder was foreign to man. But that's the point that, that sin will lead you and I to do things that we never could have imagined, that we never could have fathomed. Sin will lead us to do things that will utterly destroy us. And as the story continues to unfold, God is about to confront Cain for what it is that he's just done. And if you remember how God confronted Adam, Pastor Lincoln, uh, moments ago in, during our, our, our time of, of, of confession and, 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 and assurance of salvation, he, he reminded how last week in Genesis 3, like what did God say to Adam when they were in hiding? He, he called out to them and he called out to them with a question, where, where are you? If you remember, God confronted Adam for his sin last week, and, and when you think about it that way and you look at these two chapters together, you begin to realize that Genesis 3, 9 and Genesis 4, 9 are essentially the same exact verse because if you think about it, in both Genesis 3 and Genesis 4, God knows, God knows, he's not ignorant to the fact, he knows that Adam and Cain have both sinned against him. And yet in both situations, he's consistently the same And that what does he do? He asks them a question. He asked them a question as an invitation to graciously call them out of sin, out of hiding, and into confession. Adam, where are you? Come on out. Eight, Cain, where is your brother? The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? This question is actually a gracious invitation to, to, to come out of hiding and to come into confession, to walk in confession. God wants to meet them there in that moment. But again, you see the depravity of man over and over again is whereas Adam confessed his sin, Cain just flat out denied it. What does he say? He says, he says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Like not only does he lie to it, not only does he deny the fact that he's done it, he, re he rejects God's question altogether as if it's absurd that God would even ask the question. Like, like you think I'm responsible for that joker? And it's, this, it's at this point that God, God shifts. He shifts from being the interrogator to now being the prosecutor. He accuses Cain, verse 10, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And what we've got to realize and recognize is that typically throughout scripture, when, when people are crying out to God, when a person or a group of people are crying out to God, it's typically because they, are, they have been oppressed that it's the overworked slaves in Egypt who, who cried out to God. It's the orphan or the widow who's crying out to God for, for justice. It's the harassed and the helpless who are, who are crying out to God for help. And as the blood of Abel cries out to God for vengeance, we see God shift his role one more time. This time he's no longer gonna be the prosecutor, but now he's gonna be the judge. And so let's read a chunk of this here, starting in verse 11. And now you are cursed. You, Cain, are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its fruit, its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. The, 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 the language, original language there is a, a wandering fugitive that, that all of his days he will wander on the earth as a fugitive. And so Cain, hearing God's judgment, what does he say? He whines and complains, like any two-year-old. Cain said to the Lord, my, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground, and, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Cain goes, look, 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 I, not only have I been cursed by God, but I've been separated from God. 
And the one who committed the first murder is now afraid of being murdered. Like, like the irony of that. But then the Lord said to him, not, not so. Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. So though he was cursed by God and separated from God, he was still actually by the mercy of God, guarded by God. And as, jo- as judge, God curses Cain as he makes him a, a wandering fugitive for the rest of his life. For the rest of his life, Cain, the farmer, will reap but never get to sow. For the rest of his life, the one who, who plants will himself be rootless. And yet he continues to live in rebellion against God. He continues to live in rebellion against God. Look at what verse 16 says. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and he settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. God says, Cain, you're gonna be a wandering fugitive all the days of your life because of what it is that you have done. And yet Cain, in his defiance, settles. God has said, you're gonna be a wanderer all the days of your life, and Cain defiantly settled despite the fact that God told him that he'd be a wandering fugitive on the earth all the days of his life. But notice, listen to this, even in his defiance, he still couldn't get away from God's curse because the land of Nod, Nod means wandering. (laughs) Nod means wandering, and so this is what happens. Cain, the wandering fugitive, defiantly settles, rebels against God, and defiantly settles in the land, but he happens to accidentally settle in the land of wandering. And that irony is is part of the reality of our depravity. That whereas God has created us to rest, sin has brought about a restless wandering for every single one of us. That whereas God in Genesis 2 created us to join him, not only to rule and reign with him, but to rest with him in our rebellion, Sin has brought about a restless wandering all the days of our life. And listen to me, it doesn't get any better as the days go by or as generation, one generation gives way to another generation. Like it doesn't get better. You read through verses 17 to 24 and you find seven generations from Cain to Lamech, seven different generations. And whereas Cain, Cain gave in to sin, Lamech gloried in it. Whereas Cain gave in to sin, Lamech gloried in it. Lamech said to his wives, Ada, Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. It's like he's boasting, like, oh, a little jerk. I've killed a man for wounding me. Like, he wounded me, like, he, like he slapped me. I got a little, little, little cut on the eye, and I, and I killed him. A young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. Like, I don't, I don't know if you caught that or not, but Lamech is literally bragging to his wives, wives, plural, how far from God's design have we gotten already, about the fact that he is more violent and more vengeful than Cain ever was. Like, like didn't we just step out of the garden? Like, I, that feels like that was so long ago. Because of where we are now in light of where it was that God had originally created, which his design intended for us. Like, do you see the ravaging effects of of sin on everyone and everything that's in its path? And how literally one choice of disobedience has led to an unraveling, to a spiraling out of control of God's good design. But let's not miss the fact that, that their depravity is our reality. Their depravity is our reality and that we would be fools. We would be absolutely fools to think that we're any better off than they are. Paul says in in Ephesians 3 that every single one of us is by nature children of wrath and sons of disobedience. That we are born into this world ruled by the prince of the power of the air. That's the enemy. That's that's Satan. One scholar says that it's not just that some parts of of us are sinful and other parts are pure. It's not like, oh, I've got a bad eye, but my, my left arm's pretty good. No, 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 no. Rather, every part of our being is affected by sin. Our intellects, our emotions... Our desires, our hearts, our goals, our motives, even our own physical bodies. I got a, I got a text from a friend last night who, who said, I'm dropping off the keys to the trailer and they're on your door right now because my father just had a, a massive heart attack and I got to drive to Florida tonight. Like that's the effects of sin, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, on, on every part of us. 
But yet the whole point of Genesis 4 is that despite our depravity, God is still good and faithful to keep his promises. Despite our depravity, God in his, is still good and faithful to keep his promises. Which is why the chapter concludes, we haven't finished yet. The chapter concludes with this glimmer of hope. Verse 25 says, and Adam, Adam knew his wife again which means there's grace to begin again. And she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. And then verse 26 says, to Seth also a son was born. And he called his name Enosh. Enosh means weak. And it was at that time that people began to call upon the name of the Lord. You see, whereas Lamech saw himself as strong, Enosh understood himself to be weak. He knew who he was. That's what his name means. He knew, he knew his reality. And because he knew that he was weak, he was therefore utterly dependent upon the Lord. And it changed not only his life, but, but the lives of those that were around him. And when we are weak in ourselves, we too find the potential to be strong in the Lord. Yes, listen to me. Depravity is our reality. That every single one of us born into this world are born under the curse. And on our own efforts, we cannot escape it. Like, you cannot be good enough or gifted enough to earn God's favor or his forgiveness. But God's not asking us to fix ourselves. He's not asking us to, to put ourselves back together and then, then we can come back home. No, he's, he's asking us to recognize the fact that we can't fix ourselves. And therefore, in return, in that reality, to call upon him. To call upon the only one, the name that is above every other name, for salvation, for help, for strength. And listen, this is the good news of the gospel. Like this is the good news of the gospel that whereas the firstborn of Adam was a slayer, the firstborn of God was the savior. Like indeed, yes, it was Cain who slayed his brother, but it was Jesus, the firstborn of all creation and the better elder brother that we always needed who was slayed on the cross for all who would put their hope in him. For on the cross, the blood of Jesus has spilled, was spilled to bring you and I into the family of God. And, and Hebrews 12, 24 tells us that, that his spilled blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. For, for whereas the blood of Abel cries out for vengeance, the blood of Jesus shouts, proclaims forgiveness. Whereas the, the, the blood of Abel cries out for vengeance, the blood of Jesus shouts forgiveness. For while he was on the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So let me ask you, does your life look more like your brother, your brother Cain's life? Marked by sin as you're running in rebellion against God or are you clinging, holding on desperately to the cross of Christ, believing that his work on the cross is alone sufficient to be able to save you from sin and its full effects? Have you trusted in Christ with your whole life or are you aimlessly wandering throughout life? Is the goal of your worship to please God because you believe that he's worthy of it? Or is the goal of your worship to appease God because he has something you want? Do you see yourself as strong and able to save yourself or do you know yourself to be weak and therefore desperately, desperately, utterly dependent upon God and his grace for your salvation? Because depending on how you answer that question, those questions determines your reality. But the good news of the gospel is that the invitation of God for those who are clinging to Christ and his cross, the invitation of God is for us to join him at his table. Because despite our depravity, God is still good and faithful to keep his promises and we see that most fully 
in him giving up his son Jesus to die a sacrificial substitutionary, substitutionary death in our place on the cross that though he was sinless though he was perfect though he did not deserve to die he being being God and man in the flesh took on our sin and bore the wrath of God upon his shoulders in our place so that we would not have to he became a curse for us so that the curse of sin could be removed because when he died Three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave for all of eternity for those who would put their full faith in him. 